Hey guys, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. I'm the founder of the Austin Center for Developing Minds. Uh, we are located just north of Austin, Texas in Cedar Park. And what we do is we focus on developmental functional neurology. Hopefully you'll have a chance to catch my lecture because I'm going to be taking you through what that process looks like and why it's so important to focus on rehabbing the brain in the right way uh, at the right time with the right frequency and oscillations and all this kind of stuff, right? So I'm very honored to be a part of this conference. Uh, this conference is very meaningful. I love all the people involved and obviously the cause is fantastic. So thank you again and I look forward to seeing you soon. Due to advances in technology and bioscience, the most efficient ways emerging to treat pain and injury revolve around the nervous system. Using the human body's amazing ability called neuroplasticity, it is now possible to activate increased strength, pain-free movement, and faster healing. This is the Nubi device, a patented electrical stimulation device used for neuromuscular re-education. While conventional treatments for pain and injury only manage symptoms, the Nubi device allows you to work at the source of the problem. Using this approach, 90% of individuals notice meaningful progress in the very first session, and evidence is showing those early results also lead to faster overall recovery from most injuries and surgeries. There's finally help for people having difficulty recovering from injury, living with chronic pain, or experiencing challenging neurological conditions. Ask your doctor or therapist about the newbie from NewFit, accessing the power of the nervous system to improve outcomes. Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Parr, physical therapist and certified brain injury specialist at Parr PT Physical Therapy. And today's presentation is specialized physical therapy for brain injuries. My objectives today is really to cover um, some of the common impairments seen with physical therapy in case there are certain things that arise that you may not be sure that are consistent with the brain injury. Um, also, teaching a little bit more of the at-home activities that you can do in the meantime as you start building your wellness team, whether it's physical therapists, occupational therapists, or speech therapists. Um, what to look for in a PT, and so there's a lot of things specific that you're gonna wanna look out for um, to make sure that that person is a good fit for your child. And at the end, I'll say a little bit more about what I do and some of the services that I offer as a way to um, provide more information and more research, uh, resources to um, the community. So my background is pretty in depth. I've been a PT for about 11 years now, and um, I've also had a lot of training in different areas. I was a strength and conditioning coach, some, I'm an exercise physiologist, just understanding um, the way the body works and the way it works both on the inside and the outside. And one of my biggest things that's made me who I am today is American Ninja Warrior, I was known as a flying squirrel. I did uh, six seasons in a row and had a chance to go to Vegas for the finals and it was just an experience that was so big for me as a personal accomplishment but helped me grow as an individual when uh, treating traumatic brain injuries and other neurological conditions. Um, it made me understand more of the biomechanics of, of things that are just different, it made me look at how much fun it was and just to do something that was out of the box or just, uh, just using alternative methods of training. And it helped me understand more about that fear, that anxiety response, especially when we have all the cameras on us um, in relation to how that would be, uh, how that works for people with brain injuries learning something new. And this is why I'm a physical therapist. This is my sister, she was 21 and I was 16 when this happened. She, one morning she woke up, one side of her body was paralyzed and um, you see her here in, in basically the halo. Um, they weren't really sure what was going on and once they figured it out that there was a lesion that presented very similar to MS, um, it's called acute disseminating encephalomyelitis. And watching that as a 16 year old and, and you're seeing here, you know, the wheelchair um, she lost her speech. She had to go, you know, on the cane. And you can see some of these pictures as to why, uh, really why I became who I am as a therapist, being able to have that passion and, and have that drive to help people just like her, or even worse. 
Um, and it was because of watching her therapy with another therapist that I realized that this was something that I wanted to get into uh, personally. Um, so it, it's, it, it's dear to my heart as to why I want to present this information to you today as a way to help you in this process, because I know in the beginning it's a tough process of really the unknown of what to do and where to start, and hopefully I'll be able to answer those questions for you uh, today. But the first part I want to go over is the common things that you find with traumatic brain injury, and I'm just looking at a physical therapy standpoint. There's a lot of things that are associated with brain injuries, um, but from a physical standpoint, we find that contractures um, are a big thing where that muscle, when they're positioned in a certain position for too long, you're not able to move the arm well because the muscles gotten, uh, have gotten too tight. Um, and it's important that we keep that motion, especially early on, because as they start to get that, that recovery and start to get those movement back, they want to be able to move through that normal motion versus trying to adapt to a new motion that's not going to be functionally um, efficient for them to get back to where they were before. Um, poor awareness or neglect, just not necessarily being aware of what's around them, maybe not visually scanning, maybe having some hypersensitivity to light and sound, so there's some adjustments that you have to make there. Um, and, and that really goes with even the way your settings are, like taking them out in the community if places are too loud or, um, you know, the sun is too bright. You know, it's, it, it's so much more than just having to understand if I'm at home. It's what do you need to expect when you leave the home? Um, spasticity. Spasticity is a huge one where um, essentially you're getting involuntary muscle uh, contractures or uh, contractions um, with certain movements. Um, a lot of times when you stretch it out, you'll feel that kind of beating or that resistance going out. It's important that um, those things are considered because that may require some bracing, some splinting as a way to keep them from getting stuck in these positions um, and even being medicated for it. Uh, scoliosis is a big one. A lot of times after injury, uh, you lose a lot of that muscle tone in, in the abdominal area, and so it causes uh, the, the child to kind of just slump and just get into these awkward positions, um, which will end up causing an imbalance of the muscles in, in, the, in the back area that may alter the way the spine curves. You may find some vestibular or visual deficits, and a lot of this is related to actual trauma, traumatic brain injuries, um, actual external force. Um, whether they have chronic headaches, uh, maybe they get vertigo and they see the room spinning. Um, maybe it's more of like severe balance deficits or just kind of being clumsy and running into things. Those things have to be considered because there's different forms of therapy that are going to be specific for that that they'll need. And difficulty breathing uh, it, it, it's a big one. Being able to get them into positions that will mechanically improve the muscle contractions um, as they start learning whether it's an external device that's helping them breathe or they're beginning to transition off of that. We have to make sure what positions are we getting them into that will help that progress from external device to uh, breathing on their own, but also getting with specialists that know how to do that. Now we have stretching. So here are some at-home remedies that you can do for your child. We're going to cover upper and lower body, trunk, and the head. So I'm going to go over the lower body first. It's a little bit easier. So depending on what's going on with your child, if they have um, spasticity or if they have any stiffness, any contractures in the ankles, um, being able to get them in position on their back uh, more calm will reduce the amount of tone that they have, uh, at least in their ankles. They may get into more of an extensor tone, so we'll find different ways to do that. So assuming that the tone isn't as bad, we can go in here and put the ankle in neutral. So you don't want the leg too far out or too far in when you're stretching. So just by putting my hand underneath the base of the heel and just using my forearm, I can just lean forward. And once I feel that end range or that tightness that's keeping me from moving forward, I'm just going to stop and hold. I can hold this for 20 to 30 seconds, relax, and I can do maybe a few on one side and the other. Um, <clears throat> If you find that doing any of these stretches causes them to get into more protective response, you want to go ahead and hold off and leave that more to your physical therapist, but typically this won't cause any of those responses. Uh, we can do things for the knee, so bringing the knee to chest. Again, I can use my hand here and just lightly drive. If you find that this leg starts to elevate, then you're going too far, so take it a little bit right before then, or you can put the hand on top of it as a way to stabilize both stretching the front of the hip here 
and the glutes on this side. Okay, come in here and we can rotate. In, hold, out. Be mindful, you don't wanna really pull too far on the outside just because you put the hip at risk for subluxation or dislocation, as well as going too far um, across the body or anything like that. So you can get in these positions where as soon as you feel the tension, that's okay, just go ahead and hold for 20 to 30 seconds. But the idea here is if the child is not upright and standing and moving, we wanna keep those muscles uh, nice and loose, that way we don't develop any contractures or any tightness that doesn't allow that joint to move. So that's the lower body, so upper body examples would be, if I'm using the arm here, um, we wanna keep in mind that if your child has any subluxation or dislocations, you wanna leave this to a therapist but we can go through regular motion, we can bring it overhead, and my hand is always gonna be on the shoulder just so I can feel and make sure nothing's kind of popping out. We can hold, and then we can bring out a little bit to the side. Again, my hand's over the top. This is kind of where her stops, and so I'm just gonna hold. And then you can also get into where you're keeping the elbow bent, slightly stretching out. And that's about what I would do for the shoulder. I wouldn't necessarily stretch all the way in because typically their arm's gonna be positioned inward. Uh, for the trunk, we can get them to where if I'm doing um, both, maybe with the low back, I can bring both knees up and stretch out the bottom, even the low back. Or I can get them in sitting positions just to stretch them out a little bit more. So typically, if I have a bolster, I can almost round her over a pillow and I can just stretch this out a little bit more. So you can just be creative on depending on what your child needs um, and what their comfort levels and their tolerance is. Um, and then lastly, we'll go ahead and turn your feet this way. If you have them up and sitting or in their, they're in their wheelchair, you can do some light neck stretches and some head stretches as a way to keep this loose and as they're going through therapy or whatever um, other side intervention they might be receiving. So another way to do is I tend to put my body on them. I can grab full, basically hand and jaw, like thumb behind the ears, just so I can get full control. And I can hold them here, just take them to the end range, hold, I'll do both sides. And if, say their head is stuck back, I might even dip them forward. Uh, most of the time that's not the issue. So I would just stick with the rotation, holding on each side. Again, not performing any overpressure, but just enough to where you feel like you're keeping the mobility that they have. And now we're gonna go over positioning. So typically after an injury, the child is either laying in bed for a while, sitting in the chair for too long. So we wanna make sure that we're reducing the likelihood of them getting any form of contractures or stiffness in the muscles that doesn't really release, as well as pressure sores. So positioning is ideal and a must have whenever the child is at home beginning that, that rehab process of not only trying to activate muscles but reducing any sort of other in, uh, injuries or orthopedic wise or soft tissue. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is, depending on what position you have them lying down, we wanna make sure that we're aware of ways to make sure that they're not actually causing any uh, issues with pressure. So for one instance, whether you have pillows at home, you have yoga mats. If the pr child is on their back a lot, you wanna make sure that we are making sure we're raising their heels. And typically what happens is every two hours we wanna reposition them. So if they're in the bed all day long, we wanna make sure that we have these things set up. So for an example, one way to make sure that we're getting um, a low risk for the pressure ulcer ulcers is if they're laying down, we wanna elevate or just provide pillows underneath their, their bottom part of the leg as a way to take the heels off the ground. What that does though, it ends up putting a little bit more pressure on the bottom and low back area. So after those two hours, we have to find a way, okay, how can we reposition them to take pressure off of here and then put the load somewhere else? So that's when you can use pillows. In my case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you from one side, if I'm gonna slightly lay them on one side, I'm gonna put more of a wedge, almost like a 45 degree angle, and granted, this pillow would go all the way down to the foot and the head would be supported and they're here. So now they have weight off of this hip. So now we're getting more circulation to this area. And then you would do the same thing on the other side. You'd wedge 
And so these are the three common positions that you can put your child in if they're in bed or even in the hospital um, as a way to make sure that they're getting uh, enough pressure relief. Um, keep in mind, in this position, the legs will typically fall on top of each other. And so you do want to put some sort of pad between the feet because what happens is if you get the bone on bone, it'll start to irritate the, the ankles and the skin pretty quick. So those are options there. Um, for spasticity management, um, positioning uh, is dependent on, uh, on what they present with. So for an example, if the child tends to go more into this position, we wanna make sure that we want them more on their stomach because they can't really be on their knees on their stomach. So any sort of curled up position, ideally we either wanna put them on the side and again, we'll, we'll put our appropriate padding or ideally we wanna set them here. Keep in mind if there's any tubing um, for, for the gut or any other tubes that for whatever reason, we wanna make sure we put padding here so they're not compressing on the area. But you can find modified ways to get on the stomach to make sure that they're not get, getting into that spasticity or that, that tone that pulls them up. And it also, it's a good stretch on the front of the hips. Now let's just say that the child gets more of this kind of what they call extensor tone and they get more of this position. Now we're gonna want them more um, in positions with their knees bent. So you may have to manually put them into these positions. One of them, if you have some sort of block, and I'm showing everything on here, but if you have something padded on the floor, you'd wanna be able to get them onto their knees. You can block their knees, you can have some sort of upright support system to where they're actually getting this kind of weight bearing and you're just sitting behind them, um, holding them as a way for them to just break that extensor tone. Um, it may be a little challenging to get them in the position, it may feel like this, but uh, a trick in order to do that would be once you have them set up here, you can lift, and if their legs are straight, if you lightly just bring one knee down and the other leg straight, kind of right behind the knee, you'll be able to get them into that position here. Um, if this is too challenging, you can also get them to where you have some sort of ball, which I'll pull right now. And you can actually get them on their knees and just lay them on the ball so now they're breaking some of that tone again you're going to want to be behind them and they're more supported in this position if you need additional padding it could be something like this so there's a lot of creative ways to break the extensor tone whenever your child is um, demonstrating those kind of uh, of movement patterns um, and then now for scoliosis so scoliosis um, you know, if you're finding that your child is really, you know, in that curved position, how do we find ways to uh, position them in a way that they're not getting worse and worse? So we can find ways like things that are really soft. We can put them on, if we're curved this way, we want to bring that in so we can actually position. And again, with some head support here to where now we're opening this side up more to get more of a stretch. And we can lay them here periodically throughout the day to make sure that once they're in this position, they're not really in here, but maybe they're more in here. And then gradually we can find other assistive devices to keep them up straight, whether it's upright sitting, uh, positioning, uh, lateral supports, wheelchairs, standing frames, those kind of things are involved in just making sure that you keep the alignment. But it's important that we focus on positioning for everything because we want to keep the motion that they have and we don't want, uh, we don't want to get them stuck in another position. Exercises. So with exercises, there's a lot of different things that you can use. Uh, I actually have links at the end of the PowerPoint that show you some of these uh, pieces of equipment that are pretty affordable and it all depends on um, what level of injury that your child has. Um, you've seen those little peddlers where um, it, it, it stays on the ground and you're able to put your feet through and you're just kind of, they're just moving their legs over and over just like a bicycle. That could be used for the lower body as well as the upper. So if they're sitting and they have that device, if they're learning and you're helping them just to try to get some sort of muscle activation, again, these are more at-home remedies. 
things that are going to be more um, beneficial and efficient is going to be coming from a physical therapist. Um, and there's ways for them to train you on that. But at least there are things that you feel comfortable at least maintaining some sort of movement at home. Um, they also sell these little step machines that they're sitting. And what happens is when you put your feet on the ground, it's like this. And you're basically just moving within these movements. But it's a way to start getting some lower leg activation, even if you're helping. So anytime that you help, they're still feeling it. So we still want to give them that, that good feeling of, what it is to step, what it is to push that way as they transition back into walking. If they're not already walking, it's uh, a quicker transition for them. And one of the biggest things that we find is breathing exercises. So typically after an injury, it's uh, very challenging for them to either breathe independently where they have an external device or uh, getting them in positions to help them breathe, period, without them knowing that they're actually doing the exercises. So when they're sitting, they're going to get more of this caved chest. And the problem is that's going to restrict the amount of expansion that your ribs have. So if you find ways, whether they're laying on their back and their arms are positioned where you're keeping the rib cage open, they can actually breathe and um, exercise those muscles in between the ribs as a way to get more strength as they go through their breathes and exercises. This is assuming that they don't have any precautions on uh, bringing their arms out into this position based on any ports or any other uh, devices that might be attached to them. Uh, another way as well is if, again, I like using yoga mats that are um, not as firm. Uh, you could uh, essentially use a foam roller, but it's pretty tough um, and not really tolerated by most children. Um, but once you're on your back, you can just lay them and so now this is more on their spine and now they get a little bit more open. There's a little bit more range as a way for them to breathe in the chest. Um, and this is going to help them too with blood pressure issues. If they're not getting enough oxygen, um, this will help increase that blood flow throughout the body, uh, allowing them to do things with less fatigue and less um, stress that may cause, whether it's increased heart rate or increased blood pressure. And what I like to do for really... Um, anyone is is when it comes to their recovery that initial recovery is so important that those, let's just say those first two or three months so it's important that you get them in the right equipment so the minute they get out of the hospital you got to make sure that you have things good for upright sitting make sure that they're keeping that tone in their trunk to be able to apply that with functional movements i love standing frames um, being able to stand them with support get the weight bearing it stretches out the legs it stretches out the hips it gets them more aware visually. Actually, once they're upright, they're likely to scan more. So if you find that your child isn't really um, as alert and just kind of looking off to the side, getting more upright will improve those responses as well as improving bowel and bladder, uh, especially when it comes to constipation. Um, this would be something that you'd want to clear with, uh, with the physical therapist first because once they do get upright and they're not used to being there, there's some possibilities they may have some heart rate or some blood pressure issues, but it's something that you can have when trained by a physical therapist. And lastly, force use activities. And a lot of times after brain injury, just depending on the type that you have, what ends up happening is they may be likely um, to uh, focus on one side of the body versus the other. For an example, if, if everything that I have is on the left side and you find that when you call them, and you're standing on the right side, they're not really paying attention, that might be something what they call like neglect, where they're not necessarily aware of what's on this side. They view their middle as over here. So if you find that those kind of things are happening, you can actually place objects on the other side and reinforce that side, that where they're used to understanding both sides of the body, reaching, grabbing, even just scanning. Um, that'll help a ton with just getting their brain cognitively there uh, with being able to process er uh, everything in the room. Um, same thing with the legs, being able to do things to force them to use these, um, these muscles. Let's just say if there's paralysis on one side, we, want, we really want to focus on trying to move that arm, uh, activities that you know apply pressure. There's a lot of variations on how to do that, but that's force use uh, allows them to regenerate or I guess reconnect the, those nerves to other parts of the body that maybe were damaged um, from the injury. Now, as far as what to look for in a physical therapist, there's some key things that you wanna 
consider before finding that physical therapist to make sure that they're good fit for your child. So uh, number one for me is you have to have passion. Um, when dealing with traumatic brain injuries or any sort of neurological condition, you really have to have someone that's going all in with your child. Uh, if, if it's sort of like a mill and they're kind of just getting people in and out, that might not be a good fit because you need really that dedicated one-on-one -on -one time with your child as a way to get maximum progress um, because that, that healing time, again, is so important uh, as soon as you go into rehab that you want to make sure that you maximize those moments that you have with getting that training of uh, recovery, whether it's from a PT or even any other discipline. Um, the experience makes a huge difference. So um, bringing a child to someone who only works on knees and ankles is not going to understand or may not understand much about how to treat a traumatic brain injury and, and then the different types of brain injury that are associated with it, whether it's actual trauma, whether it's like an anoxic brain injury. There's different ways to approach it based on the type that they have, and so you want to make sure that that clinician is very aware of the different types and understands how to approach different scenarios of brain injuries, um, whether they have pediatric experience or even if they have neurological experience. I, I know myself, um, I have a big background with neurological recovery with brain injury, stroke, and spinal cord injury, but all of that wasn't really geared towards people under the age of five. But the concepts are very similar and almost the same. You just have to adjust them um, to someone who's five years old versus someone who's 20 years old. Um, and I don't always like to be a credential counter, but it does help to know whether or not they have the skills related to the type of injury that your child has. So whether it's NDT, NeuroIFRA, uh, PNF, and I have a, a few listed on here, uh, CBIS, there's something called the Schroth method, which is used for a lot of kids with scoliosis, and it's a really specific way to help realign the spine. Um, so depending on if your child presents with that, that's a really good option. Um, the NDTs and NeuroIFRAs and PNF go into finding different positions to facilitate those movements that maybe were lost, so any paralysis or any um, loss of tone, whether you're just kind of in that kind of floppy phase, those people with those certifications are able to directly target those um, systems and those muscle groups that are affected, um, as well as, you know, someone who's actual pediatric specialist or MNRI, uh, a little bit more specific to pedi uh, pediatrics, but also um, has more, more hours of experience working with all types of children, not just traumatic brain injuries. Um, now, I know a lot of times, once you get out of the hospital, um, they, they usually send home health, and so it's important that you also evaluate the person that's coming in for home health. Um, typically, the sessions are pretty short, maybe like 30 to 45 minutes, but um, you want to make sure that even the person in home health has the appropriate equipment to maximize the time that they're using in your home. So because they're driving to your home, they're not going to be able to put like a bike in the car or any sort of big equipment just because it's hard to transport in and transport out. Um, that would be something more uh, related to outpatient, but for, uh, for home health, this is where they provide you a lot of the stuff that you'll be doing to help the child. What I explained earlier about some of the stretching, some of the positioning, um, and even some of the other exercises related to facilitation, um, forced use activities where you're forcing um, the child to use the arm or the leg or whatever it's affected. You want to make sure that that person really is knowledgeable about that aside from just trying to just have them do leg kicks or just arm raises. None of that is really, um, that's not worth the value of them coming in. That's something that you can do on your own. So really, you know, spending time with that therapist and making sure that they're a good fit for your child. Um, that way, they're, you, you know, you and that therapist are on the same page because sometimes it may be that that therapist is not necessarily comfortable with um, treating children. But that's where you look for home health companies that are specifically pediatric. Uh, for outpatient clinics, um, they should have quite a bit of equipment. So whether it's like pads and swings, and there's a lot of neuro-integrative sensory work that they can do to really maximize the recovery of your child, uh, we just want to make sure that they have that equipment um, and in a safe way. So when you find an outpatient clinic and they have a lot of tools, it's going to be beneficial because as a child, you need to find things that will help stimulate them um, because they're going to get bored pretty much after a few repetitions of one exercise. You need to have multiple things versus an adult, you can just give a few. And uh, you really want a therapist um, 
that is able to communicate with other disciplines, because it's not just PT that's going to get them better. It's OT, it's speech, it's um, nursing, uh, depending on what's going on. You want to make sure that there really is constant com uh, communication, because what happens in PT is going to affect what happens in feeding and speech. It might also affect what happens from a cognitive standpoint with OT. So them understanding that they need to communicate is really going to maximize um, the results that you get from your therapies for your child. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit more about what we do at PAR-PT. So we have an inside treatment area as well as a, a full gym. And the full gym is really where we do most of our work for our, our positioning, our exercises, um, using alternative methods of rehab. So it's not just you're sitting on a bike. There's a lot of things that are related to maybe obstacle course training or ninja warrior training or um, a lot of neurological facilitation techniques. So it's really meant for like a hybrid program as a way to affect multiple systems at once versus just isolating one muscle. And uh, again, my experience with having done a lot of spinal cord injuries, incomplete and complete injuries, uh, traumatic brain injuries, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's, uh, strokes. So there's a lot of variety um, that I've seen in the past of being able to take items of each one have really helped develop these programs and a lot of our on-site trainings that we do for 60 minutes. Um, as far as what's included, you know, I mentioned a lot of the, um, basically the full body training of strength, balance, stability. Uh, we get into even like transfer training and other functional movements. We work a lot with uh, wheelchair transfer, so that's really important. Those are in the chair. Um, if they have higher level um, stability and strength up top, we have to make sure that we're also getting that function. So there is that PT side of it but also making it very stimulating and very fun for the, for, the, for the client as a way to motivate them to get back into those things. A lot of times, if, if patients um, are in a position to where they're limited with the amount of progress they'll get based on structural damage, uh, contractures, those kind of things, we have to be able to adapt them, but we wanna make sure that they're still getting that workout or that feel like they're in a gym versus being behind white walls and feeling like they're in a doctor's office. Um, and you can see here, this is one of my clients. This is actually one of the Ninja Warrior type training. She had a brain injury and we're working on balance. Now at this time, she was a little bit more advanced, but these are the type of uh, positions and uh, I'll put some links at the end for you to see some, some examples, some of the training that I've done with um, some, some kids that have had brain injuries using these alternative methods as a way to help them functionally out in the community. Uh, aside from the actual on-site training, one of the things that we specialize in is really creating programs. So our programs are individ individualized, so depending on what your child presents with, we're able to literally take that condition. If we have a video library of up to, I think it's close to 400 videos now. Now, if none of those videos apply with what he needs, or he or she needs, then we record it on-site and we give you your own personal folder of those videos. So we structure it over the course of six weeks as a way to see what their progressions might be. Um, we give a PDF explaining of the exact repetitions, what days to do them, at home remedies for whether it's for stability, for fascial releases like soft tissue releases if things are a little bit too tight. Um, we also spend that time with um, our, our assessments as being able to train the caregiver. So whether it's a nurse, whether it's a mother, a father, a sibling, on exactly how to position that, and we take time um, using that hour, uh, whether it's on-site or virtual session, as a way to train you specifically how to be the at-home PT until you find the services um, that are needed for your child. Um, and the good thing about this is that um, when I say virtual, you're not limited to just being in Texas. You can be anywhere in the U.S. since these are wellness programs as a way to help um, improve the strength and stability and motor control in your child. Um, we do have separate ones for in-town and out-of-town clients. Uh, depending on what they need, it's a little bit easier when you come in, in person, but it's stuff that we've done you know, in New Mexico and Tennessee and Wisconsin. Um, and it's worked out really well as a way to help get that transition as you find your, your, your therapist in your respective city. 
Now, we also offer physical therapy. So that is more of the wellness component that involves more of the movements and um, the strength and stabilization, whereas there, a lot of times there's issues with GI issues. Maybe there's some scars that need to be addressed that are restricting motion, whether it's in your neck, the shoulder, the hip, the stomach. We specialize in those things as well. So one of the things that we do uh, specifically is myokinesthetics. So myokinesthetics is a nerve and posture rebalancing. So there's a lot of times that post-injury, the nerves aren't firing properly because the posture is a bit off. And so by doing so, as we treat the upper and lower from a nerve standpoint, it helps realign posture and also helps the, the internal or that autonomic system work more uh, efficiently. So whether it's even blood pressure related, heart rate related, there's a lot of those techniques that we can even use for children um, to help regulate that as a way to get them to progress a little bit more. As you see, we do some GI. So those who are more constipated, a lot of times these medications will cause more of that backup and we specialize in more visceral massages as a way to help with peristalsis or that movement of the bowel out of the system. And we can show at home remedies for that um, to maintain that as a way to keep consistency with uh, bowel movements at home. Uh, we do microcurrent point stimulation therapy. And, and this is where the, the scar, so the, the idea is it's based off of acupuncture meridians and where the scar is, the scar itself, that line is not the only part of the scar. Usually it grows out to the side. So a lot of times that can restrict, you know, whether or not I can straighten my arm, whether or not I can raise it up. And without that being addressed, that's something that could limit them functionally and actually get worsen over time that cause more uh, tissue um, contractures that will ultimately limit function. So those are things that we can do for that as a way to help with um, some of the scar adhesions. And then we have the regular scar, uh, or excuse me, uh, soft tissue work that we do that's related to myofascial release. So let's just say that the contractures are beginning to develop and you need someone to help with the hands-on just to make sure that that tissue stays long enough for them to move correctly. We do all the hands-on uh, hands stuff here for that uh, as a way to combine that with the programs that we've already given you to maintain mobility and stability. We also offer matrix gait training. So gait training just means relearning how to walk. So we have our own patented device that we use, um, which uh, looks like a walker. It's more stable, it's heavier, but it has a series of, of bungees attached to it that uh, assist in moving the leg forward. So advancing the leg forward, whether you attach it at the foot, attach it at the knee. Now this device is a little bit larger, so this would be uh, more for kids over the age of 13 with injuries that are needing to relearn how to walk. And right now, we're offering uh, free 30-minute gait trials or walking sessions until the end of the year as a way to um, provide more of these services for kids that are in need. And then attached here, I have links on some of the usages of, uh, of which diagnosis. We have some stroke, we have some brain injury, we have a spinal cord injury. But this gives you an idea on how the device works in case it's something that your child might need. And right now, here's my contact information. We have uh, the website, the emails, the phone number in case you do need to reach out. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about your child or any of the services that uh, I might be able to help you out with. And also, if you have any uh, questions more about finding clinicians in your area, I'd be happy to help you out. So anything like that, feel free to let me know. And I've also attached here, I mentioned uh, some of the things that we do if you are in a different state out of town, uh, the technique called myokinesthetics. I put the link here, uh, not just for the myokinesthetics, but actually for the NDT training uh, for therapists. And you can search providers that are um, possibly in your state, and you might be able to use them as a way to get treatment in your own area if you're not in the state of Texas. And then I also have attached here the equipment list that I mentioned with that little bike, the little stepper. Um, these are just Amazon um, findings or website findings for it. Um, just so you can check it out to see if it's even something that works with your child. And that's it. And I just really want to thank everyone for taking time to tune in. Um, I'm excited to be able to provide any information that y'all might need and to use me as a resource. And um, please let me know if you have any other questions. God bless.